All right, yeah, this is Roy Future Man Wooten, and this is my pod class. Episode one, Black History and Classical Music. Throughout history, the contributions of Africans, Black Europeans, Black Americans, and people of color have profoundly shaped the entire musical landscape. Long before our modern times, Black musicians were forging paths and paving the way in all parts of the world. With this blog series, here we are in February 2022, I want to focus on the gray area of Black history and classical music where artists of today, right, such as pianist Andre Watts, composer William Grant Still, you know, he's not quite today, but, you know, in, in modern times, William Grant Still, pianist Odwigan uh, Ad, Ad, Pratt, I'm not sure that I'm getting his name right, but he's dreadlock uh, classical pianist, <clears throat> opera singers like Leontine Price and Kathleen Battle, and my friend, my good friend from a long time ago, back way back in the Bush Gardens days, Thomas Wilkins, right? These, these modern people, m- most still alive, they continue a legacy of black music that was forged in the past, black mu- particularly black music and the classical arts, okay? And I wanted to say, too, uh, shout out to Tom Wilkins because he just recently conducted my brother Victor Wooten's second bass concerto in Boston. And uh, it was really great. I was proud of Victor for uh, composing that himself and for Tom giving him the call and the opportunity to perform it live. Very, very, very cool. So we're going to get into continuing this legacy. Right. And, uh, and also the, uh, the, the, the performance series that Tom had Victor on was uh, Black Composers. So that was pretty cool. Black Vic was a black composer and soloist. So <clears throat> we're going to get back into uh, black history and classical music. Time has let the connections between classical music, the classical arts and black culture, the combination of these, right, has slipped through the cracks of our collective memory so that we do not clearly see how the peculiar institution of slavery, this is what slavery was called during the time, the peculiar institution, okay? So the peculiar institution of slavery coexisted with classical music, right? History, when we look at it, we don't clearly see how this peculiar institution of slavery coexisted with classical music and the age of enlightenment. Yes, and it produced a multiracial array of classical superstars. Everybody, hang on. This is Roy Future Man Wooten, and this is my pod class. Put your seatbelts on. We're going to have to take a little journey, all right? As, as my grandpa used to say, my mom said, he said, y'all gather around, children, because I got something to tell you, all right? So the classical arts have been influenced by a racially mixed legacy, rarely focused on in the history books. And because of this partial view of history, Classical music is usually not connected to the black experience from which some of the greatest conductors, the greatest soloists, the greatest composers all left a rich legacy. OK, now I want to go back and see. I, I, I don't want to just blow through this and you not hear what I'm saying. The first sentence I said in this paragraph was the classical arts have been influenced by a racially mixed legacy. When I'm saying racially mixed, I'm saying racially mixed race people is what I'm saying. OK. It's mixed race people. My point is this. History misses this nuance. When you say Frederick Douglass in black history, you say he's a black guy. He is a black guy, but he's mixed race. When people think of Bob Marley, could you be love? Right? He's a black hero, black legend leader. He's mixed race. Right? It goes on like that. There's so many mixed race going on. The point is, when you were mixed race during that time, you were considered black or, or more, as the, they, they would call it, M-O-O-R. Okay, so this is the point of my first sentence. This is the audio podcast version of the book. You sitting there reading, you might not hear what I'm saying, right? The classical arts have been influenced by a racially mixed legacy. Why is it mixed? Because it's the height of the global slave trade. That's what's going on that you never saw in no classical movie, okay? We in the ballroom where we're having parties and mask balls and stuff like that, but out in the field, there's work going on. That's what's happening. The peculiar institution of slavery is in full effect, okay? Strap your seatbelts. We're going to take a journey, all right? So 
this black experience, right, produced some of the greatest conductors, okay, the greatest soloists, the greatest composers who all left a rich legacy. We're going to look at that because this is Black History Month. Come on. In the 15th and 16th century, the European slave trade was in full swing. Black people were transported to various parts of the world and systematically stripped from their culture and their humanity. In most of the Western civilizations, black slaves were no longer considered human, and they had the same legal status as animals and cargo. Written history does not show in detail how this peculiar institution, peculiar institution in quotation marks, right? This peculiar institution of slavery enabled slave owners to dominate their slaves. Particularly, they can dominate their slave women, okay? They, at this peculiar institution, nobody could tell them no. So they could dominate their slaves, but they could dominate the slave women, okay? Which resulted in many kids being born of mixed race heritage and status, okay? I want you to hear what I'm saying now. Now we're, we're getting into the nuance. This age produced a whole lot of mixed race superstars, okay? Some of these children were allowed to take their father's name. See, this is key. All the slave owners, they call it miscegenation, where you're mixing race. It was against the law, but everybody was doing it. So anybody that had a problem with it, like with Thomas Jefferson, he had all them kids with Sally Hemmings, and everybody was like, oh, Jefferson, you're breaking the law. But, you know, we need the glass houses, don't throw stones. You know what I mean? Wasn't nobody trying to, like, <laughs> you know, they, all they could do is just, you know, try to throw dirt because he's running for president and embarrass him. But everybody's down with it. Everybody's down with the mixed race thing. <clears throat> My point is that there's a whole bunch of kids back there with no names. See what I'm saying? You're, just a, you're the offspring of the slave owner. You, when you grow up, you're just going to be working in the field or something. See what I'm saying? You might not even have a name. So this is my point. Some of these children were allowed to take on their father's legal family name. That's a huge sentence. That's all I'm trying to say. That's a huge sentence. You got a name? Your father thinks enough of you and your talent. A lot of times, see, they're super gifted. See, they, they say, man, this, this kid got a light, man. It's like, whoa. It's like the angels gave you this kid through the odd Lady, you like the creature, like the Salieri said of Mozart. Why did you give the creature the, the, the talent? That's what's happening. These kids are so bright that the father's like, yo, man, yeah, we got to give you a chance in society. That's what's going on, okay? So some of these, they were allowed to take on their father's legal name, right? And given a chance to learn, to grow and succeed in society. Listen to me. Some of these multiracial kids grew up to become the greatest names of history. From Alexander Pushkin, who was known as the father of Russian literature, right? To Alexander Dumas, you know, whose son uh, Dumas wrote the Three Musketeers about his mixed race father, who was a guard for the king, Right. Bad cats, man. Like right? the king's hiring these mixed race bad cats. Right. Alexander Dumas, son, wrote the Three Musketeers to Franz Joseph Haydn and Chevalier St. George, who's the script that I'm working on because everybody's there during his time. Right. So listen, Alexander, from Alexander Pushkin to Alexander Dumas, from Franz Joseph Haydn and Chevalier St. George, from Beethoven to Bridge Tower and others, okay? Now, what I'm saying is none of these people were slouches. Everybody knows the name Beethoven, but they, you don't know that Beethoven was called the Moor during his time. So f to, to follow this up on your own, you can go to Thayer, who's the expert on Beethoven. Thayer on Beethoven, T-H-A-Y-E-R. There's a passage in there and says how Beethoven wouldn't recognize himself now the way they portray him. Because when he came to France, he was pockmarked, bewigged, and he had more of the Moorish features than his teacher Haydn, who was also the Moor. I was like, really? <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, now I just did a twist on classical music right there. I just threw, this is February 20, 2022, and you can just stop what you're doing. Because I'm just about to ruin the image and the style that you used to, okay? Let me say it again. From Alexander Pushkin to Alexander Dumas, Franz Joseph Haydn to the Chevalier St. George, from Beethoven to Bridge Tower, who was a great virtuoso violinist coming after the Chevalier St. George. 
He was so great. Him and Beethoven are hanging out. And Beethoven wrote Symphonica Mulatica, the crazy mulatto, right? He wrote this bad violin concerto, and then they had a falling out because Bridge Tower hit on a woman that Beethoven was liking. So Beethoven crossed his name out of the concerto and gave it the Kreutzer, the Kreutzer Violin Concerto. Violinists heard of that, right? But you didn't know it was written for Bridge Tower. And Kreutzer couldn't play it because whoever was teaching Bridge Tower was teaching Chevalier St. George stuff. Chevalier St. George is the cat, right? So Bridge Tower, when he did the opening of the, the, what is now called the Kreutzer Violin Concerto, Man, do sight read it in a morning concert. It's like, oh, do sight read a concerto, man. Anyway, what I'm telling, what I'm trying to say is these cats were not slouches. Why are they not slouches? Because they got a chance, man. Right? The father fought enough of them to fight for them. They had to fight to get in them schools, man. You integrate in the school, Chevalier St. George, the greatest sword fight of all Europe, is going to integrate sword fighting school that's like integrating golf michael jordan can't even integrate some golf courses he's not allowed that's why he started his own even golf has that like racial divide to this day see what i'm saying so sword fighting was like golf so here comes chevalier st george during the height of the slave trade going to integrate the school black kid brother better know how to fight before he gets there that's the point there's the movie the dude knows how to fight before he gets there, and he has to let them know what's up, okay? None of these people on that, what I just read you are slouches, right? You know who Beethoven is, but you didn't know, right? You know who Haydn is, but you didn't know, right? I'm dropping it because it's February 2022, and ain't nobody else going to tell you, all right? We're going to have fun, right? So as Black History Month comes to a close, we'll take a journey to note the significant achievements in literature, music, the classical arts, as it relates to black history and culture. We're going to put a spin on it that you don't hear the spin, right? To see important mixed race artists and black composers as they were seen in their own time, where one drop of mixed blood made all the difference to anyone's status of color, right? It made a difference to anyone's status and privileges in society, all right? So when we talk about Beethoven, Beethoven is the more. Who else is the more? Othello and Shakespeare. Anytime you see Shakespeare and you see the more, you see he looks like a more. But anytime you see a movie about Beethoven, he don't look like the more, right? History is like holding back a little bit. See what I'm saying? It's like we got to understand Beethoven during this time. That's why he's having such a time. He has Immortal Beloved because he's playing for high society, but he can't marry into that society. He can't really be with his immortal beloved, right? So to understand Beethoven, we have to go and see the movie 12 Years a Slave. That's what time it was. <laughs> it was the height of the slave trade. That's what's going on. So when you hear these hymns and feelings in Beethoven's music, it's like we touching into black history and classical music, okay? This is Roy Future Man Wooten, and you in my pod class. Here we go, right? So if you had a drop of mixed blood, this made a difference to anyone's status and privileges in society. And so this will enable us today to have a better perspective on the social framework that shaped their music. Okay, in music lit and classical music, you're always studying what is the social thing going on behind what they're writing. So when I'm saying Beethoven is the more like Othello is the more in Shakespeare. Now we get to Erosia. Beethoven is writing this glorious thing for Hitler. He's got all this promise for society. He's going to do the right thing. It's going to be great. And then Hitler, when you learn, I learned about this in the Chevalier St. George story. The 1800s comes and Hitler reinstitutes the slave codes because in Europe they had gotten rid of it through the abolitionist movement. William Wilberforce, they voted, boom, they backed slavery up. Now it's William Wilberforce. Deep story, man. Like William Wilberforce spoke for like, seven hours or something like who makes a speech i got the speech too it's hard to find but i i didn't find it a friend of mine i gave up she's like she wouldn't give up man she dug that speech out man I spoke for like four or seven hours man to end the slave trade this is a movie in itself okay so this podcast is really i'm trying to speak to young kids who are the film directors younger than spike lee younger than john singleton 
younger than um, who just did the Black Panther, Ryan Kogler, to be inspired by them. There are stories yet to be told. And so I'm letting you know these stories haven't been told yet. OK, so to have that drop of black blood, now we're seeing the classical music like in living color. It's like, oh, wow, this is what's going on. All right. So none of these are slouches. OK, that's 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 my point. And we're talking about the social framework that shaped this music. OK, so Beethoven, he has feeling about Napoleon in the 1800s. He brings back the slave codes and brings the guillotine back out. Because, see, that whole Revolutionary War, the guillotines, they had, that had went away. You know, the, the, the Enlightenment came and, you know, like slavery was going away. And when, slave, when Napoleon came back in, all that came back. Poof. Okay? So what does Beethoven do? He crosses his name out and names it Erosius. Not, not, no, I'm not writing for that. He's not down with that. But we got to understand Beethoven the more to really understand that. Okay? Right. So what I'm saying, to have this better perspective on the social framework that shaped their music. What, what's the social framework that's shaping the music of Beethoven the more, hiding the more, okay? We got to look at the challenges and the challenging times that often motivate great achievements. That's the moral of the story. Challenging times that often motivate great achievements. I'd like to thank the National Museum of African American Mu uh, Music uh, in Nashville, for extending the invitation to start blogging for Black History Month through Black Music Month. Okay, so I, di I didn't even realize February is Black History Month. June is Black Music Month. Okay, so this is a blog a week leading all the way up to Black Music Month. That's what was the purpose of this, uh, this what's now ending up being my book, right? It's my intent during this time, right, during our time here, through these blog, these blog... <laughs> Through these pod cla pla classes, right? I'm calling them pod classes. They're going to be podular, right? It's my intent during this time to acknowledge some of the contributions of black Africans, black people, black Europeans, and black Americans from the New World, who beyond their many slave status identities were collectively known like Othello and Shakespeare as Moors and blackamoors, and who profoundly shaped the classical music landscape, paving the way for others, past, present, and future. My name is Roy Futureman Wooten, and this is my pod class. <laughs>